For the first four years of my career, I've gotten pinned into the social media world, which I'm very grateful for. You've seen the hype style sports edits that I've done. You've seen all the social media content that I've created, but Under Armour came to me this year and they wanted to create some kind of long form. Now, total transparency, they know this, I know this, definitely a change for me. Haven't done really much of any long form in the past, but definitely a road I want to go down. Very grateful that a company would come to me and want me to do a project that I want to do, but don't have a whole lot of work to show for it. That's not very common. And that's a testament to why you should just make stuff whenever you're starting out, because you have nothing to show for a reason that they should actually hire you. So in my case, even though I'm a few years in, have a couple of cool names under my belt, this project is something I'm really excited for, but it also comes with a lot of gear changes. Some things are the exact same and some things are like, wow, if I'm going to make these longer form videos where I'm going to be filming documentary style, there are a few essential pieces that I need and there's just a different way that I need to rig things up. So that's what we're talking about today. Something that I've definitely tended to do over the course of buying new gear is always keeping things minimalistic. Like I haven't owned a monitor until just a few weeks ago and I do mostly work in video and not photo. So that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, but I like a small setup where you can just be as bare bones as possible. The amount of shoots that I went to and I just had a camera, a lens and a microphone and there are people filming the same kind of thing as I am with a huge rig. I didn't care and I didn't need to have that stuff because the quality of mine would be damn near theirs and I didn't have to break my back having a big rig and it's just what I liked so that's what I did. The majority of the content that we're going to be filming is going to be handheld so that I don't have to worry about balancing my gimbal whenever we're going in and out of a car or trying to follow him around and you still want that kind of raw feeling so for me the handheld vibe is going to get us in that direction. Before we go any further I can't show any footage yet, the video's not out. You can look for the different content showing the footage and bring it back down later, but that's not what this video is. It's not out, so I can't just like leak the raw footage. So, continuing. For the camera that I'm using, I'm using a Canon R5. That's what this video is being filmed on right now as well. And the majority of the time when I'm filming in this documentary style, I'm going to be using the 4K HQ mode in 23.98 frames per second, also known as 24. It's the same thing. And what that's doing is it's pretty much the camera recording in 8K, which it has the ability to do, but then downsampling it to spit out a 4K file so that the file size will be smaller, but the sharpness will just be a little bit better. After filming the first episode of this series, there are a couple things that I would kill to have, and it's the first time I'm actually considering, wow, maybe I would like having some variation of a cinema camera and internal NDs are one of those things where I don't have to be screwing on and off my ND filter. And the other one is multiple audio inputs. That might sound crazy to you, it might not sound essential, but having my shotgun mic and my lavs plugged in at the same time and recording would be really, really nice. Now, yes, I know you can record internally on the lavs. We'll talk about which ones I'm using later, but it's not always great for the workflow because when you are shooting and editing everything, ah, it just sucks to have to go and line it all up and post. I do record internally typically as a fallback, but if I can run it into the camera, it just makes everything easier, especially in certain scenarios. On the Canon R5, the lens that I'm using the majority of the time is the 24 to 70 f 2.8. We've talked about in the past, it's a beautiful lens because you don't really need that much wider than it unless you're doing something specific. Tighter, yeah, sometimes you need a 70 to 200, but the 24 to 70 range is really perfect, especially for this documentary style filmmaking. Next up, and this is where the real changes come for somebody like me, where I uh, always have kept it minimal, but this is, this is a big change. On my R5, I have what's called the Black Mamba kit from Small Rig. With that, it's a cage. That's what I had on for a while. 
The nice thing about this cage is that on my tripod, it can connect without a plate. That makes it really nice so I don't have to be lugging these plates around. But the beautiful thing about this cage is that you can either have a top handle or no top handle. So this right here is the main addition that a lot of people uh, won't believe that I'm using if you've been here for a while. I got a monitor, finally. And that monitor is attached onto a handle that goes on the top of the camera. So this handle is part of the Black Mamba kit. You can attach this right onto the top of the camera so you can hold the rig just like this. Now, the monitor I have attached a little bit weird. I have a small rig mount. The mount that I'm using to attach the monitor to the top handle is an RE style mount. So it screws instead of using a cold shoe where it wouldn't be that secured. So this is screwed in and it's really not gonna move. There's no chance of it really falling off. Then the weird thing that I do with my monitor is that I mount it upside down. I mount it upside down because Whenever the monitor is here, I didn't want the HDMI input to the monitor to be rubbing against the microphone that is on the left side of the rig. That would mess up your audio without a doubt. So what I did is I mounted my monitor upside down so that the input to the monitor would be on the right side and then I can take my coiled HDMI over and plug it into the R5 without having any wires over here to intersect with my audio. If anything rubs against the windscreen or the microphone, it's going to mess up your audio a little bit. So that's why I do just that. The batteries or whatever came with the monitor. The monitor is the Atomos Shinobi. I don't have the ability to record internally to the monitor, but coming from the world where I've never used a monitor in the past, I didn't want to drop 1300 bucks on a small HD monitor. So that's why we are using this came in at, I want to say it was about $350, got two batteries. So if one dies, I can charge the other one. The batteries do die pretty quickly. I'm not used to having to shut off the monitor and then turn it back on. It does take a second to turn on and off. So you might miss something if you turn the monitor off. I like it. Not crazy crazy about it but i think me not being crazy about it is more so because i'm not used to using a monitor and not because there's anything wrong with this i also grabbed a couple of backup hdmis to connect the monitor i will say this small rig hdmi i had this for the first shoot the other day using the r5 this wire broke so i don't really recommend the small rig HDMI to micro HDMI. That's what I use on the R5. This thing broke after using it for less than two weeks. Take that as you will. Now the next few things that I've had so we won't talk about too much that I'm using are the Rode NTG microphone. I love this because you can adjust your audio levels on the fly without clicking on your camera. It has a dial on the back of the microphone. Whenever I'm using this microphone, the settings that I'm using, the middle one, I'm at minus 20, and then I turn the volume all the way up on the microphone so we can run audio through this microphone and keep the levels down on the camera. Whenever you keep your levels down on the camera, you're not gonna get as much fuzziness. You're not gonna get as much noise with your audio. So keeping this at 15 with the ability to turn it down on here if a group is yelling. Usually whenever it's a football camp and they're breaking down. So it's like, you ain't next on three, one, two, three, you ain't next. It gets really loud. So I can turn it down on the microphone and not have to sit there clicking through my menus on my camera. This makes it a whole lot easier alongside with the Rode Wireless Pros, which I have a whole video about, but these things are great for the interviews and for miking players up. Now that I think about that, I need to show you something else I got for miking players up. Didn't use it because it didn't come in in time. We don't need to talk about that. FedEx messed up my order. But to mic a player up, I got this right here. No, it really is not much more glamorous than it looks. This is the Ursa strap for miking people up. Not designed for the road mics, but it's going to be the best one for you whenever you mic somebody up. And whenever they have a jersey on or something of that nature, 
And for me, I don't want to see a big brick on their collar or a lav on their collar. Just lowers production value. So we don't need to do that if we don't have to. So you'll wrap it around the player as so, and then it's on them, especially whenever they're wearing a compression shirt over top of it, it's gonna hold it a little bit better. You're gonna grab one of your microphones. This will work the same with the different microphones that you might have with the DJIs, with these roads. I would definitely recommend putting a windscreen on. The windscreen is not as much for wind in this case, but it is just for whenever it's rubbing against their shirt. And then you're just gonna go ahead to that gap. You can either clip it right on over or for a little added security, slide your clip right through there. And just like that, they are mic'd up right in the middle of their chest with their compression shirt holding them up. This can get a lot tighter than it is. It's Velcro, it's high quality. When a mic and player's up, we got one more thing to talk about because it sounds like a crazy thing, but if you're in the film world, get it. The last thing I'm gonna recommend that you keep in your bag for multiple reasons, they come in handy way more often than they should. A pair of old, probably tangled up, Apple wired headphones. I guess they don't have to be Apple, but I have an old pair that I like. Throw these in, plug this into your camera, and you can listen to what the player is saying whenever they are talking, whenever they're mic'd up. You can also plug this in to the Rode receiver, which is really nice. So if you want to have your shotgun mic plugged into your camera, you can grab your Rode mic receiver in the same port that you would plug into to connect it to your camera, to bake the audio into your camera. You can plug your headphones in, and then all of the sudden, I can hear exactly what's going into these microphones. Makes it very nice. Not as easy to hear whenever you have it plugged into the receiver as it is your camera because you can adjust the different audio levels and microphone levels on your camera a lot better than the receiver. But having a janky old pair of wired headphones will probably come in handy, especially when your AirPods die too and you're editing a video. The last few things that I'm definitely taking are my tripod, which is the Promaster XCM525. Weird name, but this thing has been in my bag for a while. Not a terribly expensive one compared to some of the tripods that people like. Also not cheap. This thing, I've had it for years and I really like how small it is fits in a carry-on suitcase as well so that's very nice i'm gonna take my ronin rs3 pro that comes in handy whenever i'm on the field with them didn't use them in the last episode because we we're at the quarterback this week we are going to be with a wide receiver so i'm probably going to be running around with the wide receiver and the ronin so that'll come in handy we got no lighting because we want all natural lighting. I might make a video about that, so we won't talk about that too much, and that's it. Thank you for watching. Can't wait to show you more of these videos. If you're still here, drop a comment saying, new projects in 2024. That's a cool one. For me, that's what this is. I can't wait to make more behind the scenes content around this entire series. I think it's gonna help a lot of you. It's also learning with me as I go because I bet you all the things I showed you here aren't perfect and I should add some different things in episode one versus episode five. There are gonna be different things in my kit that I'm gonna have and wish I had all along. It's all a learning experience, but we're still doing a good job. Can't wait to show you guys these projects. Hope this video helped you and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching. Peace.